clearly not a dancer here. So um, that's why I'm a librarian, and that's why I have dancers on my panel. And everybody can hear okay? Uh, wonderful. So welcome. So excited to hear all of you, and I'm hoping my hair is not going to interfere with this. Um, so I want to welcome you all to the ninth episode in the Fishnets and Spotlight, Spotlights series. And I want to thank, this is our, yeah, we, we, we would have been up to about 11 or 12 if COVID hadn't interfered. But, and I want to thank the Clark County Library and our events coordinator, Suzanne Scott, for making today's event possible. And we so appreciate you joining us today, despite today's oppressive heat, to comm commemorate the 40th anniversary of the premiere of Don Arden's Jubilee at the MGM Grand Hotel, which is, yay! And of course, it was uh, July 30th, um, 1981, and I did get the date uh, wrong on the flyer, so I looked that up, so. And so I hope everyone has been able to fill out their name tags in the lobby with the years they were in Jubilee or other production shows on the Strip. And after the panel, we'll have some time to gather in the lobby to chat and mingle, and um, hopefully a, a few of you will get some individually wrapped snacks and bottles of water. So. Today we want to welcome three very special guests who will talk about the part they played in this momentous occasion. So, first, okay, I would like to welcome costume designer, instructor, and author Diana Eden, who worked as an assistant to Pete Menifee and Bob Mackey as they created the fabulous costumes for Jubilee. So, welcome Diana. And this, this is Diana's book, Stars in Their Underwear, which is a wonderful, fun <laughs> romp down um, memory lane. And now for a truly wonderful treat and honor, I'd like to welcome back to the stage Janet Ford Spellman and Tricia Lee Libuichi, two of the dazzling principals in the original cast of Jubilee. And there we have um, some photos of, of Trisha and Janet as Dawn's bookends, as they were called. Um, so fun, fun stuff. And that's the minstrel opening number. Um, those were, you said they were PR photos that they took before the fire, I believe. Right. And, and the costumes eventually did change a little bit. Yeah, the hats changed. Yeah. So wonderful. So I wanted to uh, put uh, Las Vegas in 1981, in July of 1981, in context for us all, just so we can think about how much the um, town has changed since then. And that is a close to 1981 photo. It's, it's the 1970s, or probably 1980. It's Hallelujah, Hallelujah Hollywood is still on the marquee. But it's close enough um, for our purposes to get an idea of what the strip looked like. And um, so you can see the population was 459,000. So, and just to compare in 2016 when Jubilee closed, it was 2,364,000. And that's the Las Vegas metropolitan area. And so what was happening on the Strip? So these are some of the shows that were on the Strip in 1981. Um, I looked up a magazine, Las Vegas, some of you may remember, um, and looked at the entertainment section for um, the July 1981 issue. And uh, at the Stardust, of course, we had Ale Vido, and the Tropicana, we had the Folie Bergere 81, and the Dunes, we still had the Casino de Paris, but I think it may have closed this year. Somebody might know in the audience. Uh, Flamingo, there was um, Razzle Dazzle, which was an ice skating show. And at the Silver Slipper, we had Kenny Care in Boylesque 81. And at the Silver Bird, there was Matt Gregory's Feminine Touch. So this is what was, you know, the context of how many shows were on the strip in 1981. Oops. So I wanted to show this quote of Don. He was interviewed um, by the Review Journal. Um, uh, right around the time the show opened, and I thought this was a good uh, uh, exposition of his creative process. You know, I start with the dream, and then I get a feeling for scenery, and with it all the colors, and, and following that, I imagine the costuming, and finally the sense of music, and the dream finally becomes a reality, and I thought that was a wonderful um, 
way to describe somebody, somebody who we all have uh, called a genius um, in his, the way he was able to bring so many elements of uh, dancers and scenery and costumes all together and um, in such a flawless, flawlessly executed way. So I wanted to start with some questions for um, um, our panelists to talk about how they got started as uh, dancers and example, for example, to talk about their formal training and their first professional job. And, and we have quite a contrast between um, Janet and Trisha because uh, <laughs> Janet was the hometown girl and uh, uh, Trisha was of course from Australia and had come from Paris and had gone on tour with Miss Bluebell. So just maybe a little bit about your early background and how you got into dance. Oh, well, there's a lot of contrast between Trisha and I. <laughs> um, not only that I was a hometown girl, but I really wasn't formally trained at all. So I started, I, I actually was taking classes at UNLV, and I wanted to get out of taking a PE class. I didn't want to do field hockey, so I thought, oh, I'll do a modern dance. So I was 19. I had taken a little bit of ballet when I was very young, but really, we can't call it formal training at all. But anyway, so I did this class, and Nora Catiano was the uh, dance teacher, and she was about this tall. <laughs> and she goes, oh my gosh, you're the perfect showgirl. And I went, oh, I had never thought about that before. you know. And my family, um, we just didn't go to the strip. We weren't really, we didn't see shows and everything else. So. I thought, well, I don't know what I want to do, so maybe I'll try out. So I did, and I tried out at the Follies, and I didn't make it. I just didn't have any idea of what to do. But they, they were very kind there, and the line captain took me backstage. She took all this horrible makeup off my face, because <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And um, she said, you know what, you'd be great for fluff. And I'm like, fluff? <laughs> what kind of name is that, right? But she goes, I'm going to call fluff. She's having a little audition in a few weeks in between shows. So I, I did that, and it was really incredible. And I just, um, I ended up getting it. There were five girls, and um, three of them were taller than me. And, then, and I was just like, oh my god, I found my people. You know, it's just <laughs> great, because I was always the tallest one, wherever I was. And um, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. So. I wanted to point out, if some of you didn't know this, that uh, Janet's mother is sort of a legend in Nevada um, for all her work that she did. Uh, Jean Ford, <laughs> and there she is um, with Janet. Mm -hmm. and, and she is, when I first started working at UNLV in 1999, you know, Jean Ford was the legend. She was the person who started the Nevada Women's Archives, of which I was a curator. And she was the person who was just responsible for um, um, uh, preserving so much history that had to do with women in Nevada, and she was in so many organizations. She was a state senator, a state assemblywoman, I believe, mm -hmm. and was part of the League of Women Voters, and she was instrumental in working out um, desegregating a Clark County schools. She did so much, so I just wanted to point out, if you didn't know that about <laughs> Janet, this is her wonderful, famous mother. Yeah. So, so. And so, Trisha, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you got into dance? Um, so. I loved ballet. Okay, I'm making a noise. Here. I've been me. I've been me. So I loved ballet, and um, I grew up in Sydney, Australia. And uh, my uh, mother sent me to the dancing school because that was what I really wanted to do. And so I trained in classical ballet uh, from the age of seven. Did all my Royal Academy of Dancing exams up to Solo Seal, and. Uh, attended the Australian Ballet School, which was a select group of young people who were selected from Australia every year, 20 of us, and uh, so at 15 I left high school, much to my parents' dismay, <laughs> and uh, went to Melbourne and attended the Australian Ballet School. Oh, oh. Hey, what's on? It's just your mic isn't working. It's not working. Okay, I don't know what to do. Can you hear now? Yeah? Can you hear now? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Take mine. Whoever's in charge. Sure. Thank you. 
Sorry about okay. that. Okay, let's try that. Okay. So anyhow, I love ballet. And so I trained in Australia, did all my exams with the Royal Academy of Dancing and went to the Australian Ballet School. Um, in my second year, as a year two student, um, they told me I kept growing. And they told me I would never be able to be in the Australian Ballet and that my, I would be better off served to go to England or America. And so my parents, uh, I was 16 at the time, uh, my parents did not want me to go to New York. Uh, but they said that I could go to London, so I went to London and trained in London. Classical ballet all the way. Um, and I trained with a Russian teacher during the week, but on Saturdays I could go to any class that I wanted to. And this one Saturday I went, I went to the class where I usually went, and there were all these tall girls there. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was used to dancing with girls that came up to here, and they were all so tall. So it turned out that they were Bluebell girls and they were working at the London Palladium uh, for the command performance, I believe for the Queen Mother. And that was in 1967. And so, um, and so they pulled me aside and they said, well, all this classical ballet stuff, you're never gonna do it. You need to join the Bluebell girls. Mm -hmm. So that was my first introduction to Miss Bluebell. I didn't have a clue. I was in London, I was naive and 17, and I didn't know. But anyhow, after a little thought, and um, I auditioned uh, in London for Miss Bluebell, and uh, about a month later, I got a letter asking me if I would like to go to the Far East. She had one spot left on a tour of the Far East with 12 girls. So, sure, I called my parents, I'm going to the Far East. And so they were horrified. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, off I went and, you know, it was, it was a very protective environment. Um, we were 12 girls. We were never only allowed to go out, all 12 together. Um, it was a great, um, a great time to learn about a new form of entertainment and um, I had a great time. And on top of that, the tour ended in um, Singapore and so I thought, well, I can go home after that. So I did, I went home and uh, about a month later, I get a letter from Miss Bluebell, I'd like you to come and work at the Lido. So I, I said to my parents, Miss Bluebell would like me to go and work at the Lido. So uh, by then I was 18, so I was growing up. And uh, so off I went to Paris and I joined um, the cast at the Lido as a Bluebell girl where I worked for, I think I was um, about three years as a Bluebell and then I progressed to be a um, principal dancer in that show. And um, every year we change shows. So it was a very good education in, um, in the dance form and um, in cabaret because we would change, change shows every year. Plus we would do the prior show, second show, and the new show and the first show. So we were busy. And at that time, all dancers worked seven days a week. So I spent five years at the Lido um, and that was also a exceptional education for me. And I took ballet class because ballet is still my true love, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, then Don, Don choreographed some of those shows and Bob Turk did some in the middle. And uh, so then he was in Paris and he said, well, I'm doing a new show in Las Vegas um, at a new hotel called the MGM Grand and I would like you to um, come and be the principal there. So I said, oh, okay. That was a big step, because some people told me you shouldn't really go to Las Vegas. You don't want to go and work in Las Vegas. Okay, so do I stay in Paris or do I go and work in Las Vegas? So I had a contract for six months, and so off, off I went with my husband. I was married by that time. And, um, and we came to Las Vegas. I had a contract for six months. Well, the show didn't open for five months. We rehearsed for five months because there were problems with the elevators. And uh, so the show finally opened, and um, 49 years later, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's it. <laughs> yeah. 
And so for Diana, you started out as a dancer and an actress. And so how did you transition into costume work? And how did you end up working on this project with Bob Mackey? Sorry, technical difficulty. This one's working. That one's working. And I can also give you this one. This is not working. No, I just turned it off. Let me turn it on here. Hello. Yay. <laughs> Um, actually, my background is so similar to yours, I can't believe it. I, I was born in England and then um, we moved to Canada and I trained with the ballet company. And um, at 15 I performed with the ballet company. At 16 I'd grown two more inches. And they said, you're out of here. <laughs> so um, uh, I went and uh, danced on Broadway. Um, I didn't know about Las Vegas at the time. Had I known, uh, who knows? Um, you know, a place for tall girls, yay. Um, and, uh, but um, I spent a number of years um, dancing uh, professionally and then acting professionally. And um, uh, I was kind of, by the time I got to my mid-30s, it was... Where am I going? Is this really working? Um, and uh, through a chance meeting, um, I uh, met someone who was a producer for Anne Margaret's nightclub act. Now, I don't know if any of you were here in the 70s, but her nightclub act was fabulous. Dancers and singers and sets and costumes and the best band, live band ever. Um, and um, so I was hired to coordinate the dancers' wardrobe and um, that led to my meeting Bob Mackey, because uh, he was designing for all the big stars, including Anne Margaret. And um, so, um, uh, sometime later, around or late 70s, I think 79, he said, I'm doing a really, really big show um, in uh, Las Vegas called Jubilee. And it's going to take a year to build, and it's got thousands of costumes, and would you like to assist me? So um, I said yes. <laughs> and that's how I came to transition into uh, uh, costume design, and eventually I went on to uh, you know, design my own shows. But at the time, Jubilee, I was learning everything from Bob and Pete Menifee, who was the other designer and uh, got to come up to Vegas for eight weeks and work with all these wonderful people and feathers and rhinestones, more than you could ever imagine. This is uh, one of Pete's uh, designs here up on the screen, mm -hmm. along with the finished costumes there on the left. So, and I know those, again, were the pre-fire costumes, that particular costume there, the mm -hmm. minstrel costume. Um, and here's another one, uh, Diana. This is the one where, <laughs> yes. um, uh, this for example, um, was one where um, you were told to select chiffon that when on stage and illuminated by the lights will be so breathtakingly beautiful that the audience will weep. Yes, um, that so was then, my instruction as I was headed downtown on a day much like today in LA because everything was built there. And uh, I had gone downtown um, to get swatches. Uh, pe people ask me what did I do as an assistant and you know um, I kind of did everything that they needed depending on whatever it was whether it was organizing, making lists, setting up fittings, finding fabrics, fitting shoes but this one day I was sent downtown to find blue chiffon for these costumes and I came back with I think about three or four swatches. No no, this one's a little too gray. Oh, this one is just dreadful. Uh, Ray was quite uh, direct. So, back in the car, downtown again, hot and sweaty. Um, I came back with uh, another set. I mean, how many blue chiffons are there? Um, and uh, so that's when he said his famous phrase, very droll, I want a blue that when it is lit, um, when the audience sees it, they will weep. <laughs> so, I guess I found it, because the costumes were made. <laughs> yeah, they were. 
So we wanted to talk about the two jubilees, the jubilee before and after the fire. And Tricia and, and Janet, you were both in Hallelujah Hollywood, which was the immediate predecessor of Jubilee at the MGM Grand. And Tricia, you were one of the featured principals um, since 1973. And Janet, you were one of the MGM girls, or? Well, um, here. We're sharing just like we used to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, so I, I auditioned for, is that too loud? Okay. Um, my first show was Hollywood Hollywood back in 76, and that's that story that I was telling where I went in between shows and she had a very small audition. And I ended up getting it, and I was a showgirl. Back in Hollywood, they were really showgirls. They really barely danced. Um, they walked around, they were beautiful girls, incredible costumes. And then, so that's what I did for a year. And then um, I, was, I would stand, I was one of the girls that stood there and I would watch Trisha every night in her opening. And I can't remember the name of the song, but it was so beautiful. She was with the lead singer and oh, she would just come out and just float around and be incredible. And I was watching her and I'm like, oh, I want to do that someday, you know. So I, um, I auditioned for Fluff after a year of being a showgirl and I really started taking a lot of class. I became very dedicated to becoming better or at least decent, and, <laughs> and I auditioned for, for Fluff as a covered bluebell. And she just said, and it was just a me and her kind of audition. And she goes, well, Janet, she goes, no, you're not ready yet. I said, well, then I am gonna leave, you know. <laughs> so I went over to the dunes and I danced at the dunes and the showgirls there did a lot more at dancing. And then I opened, I went and auditioned for Dawn for the new Lido, which was Ali Lido at the Stardust. And I got that and I was a dancing nude there. Because they didn't actually have showgirls at that point in that show, they just had dancing nudes. And you did do a lot more dancing. And then I ended up going to Paris with Miss Bluebell. And I ended up, and all the whole time I'm taking a lot of class. And I am getting a little bit better every time. <laughs> and then uh, I became a, um, what do you call it, principal understudy in Paris. And so I did that there. And then when I came back, um, Don had mentioned to me, he said, you know, if you come back and do the last year of Hollywood as a dancing nude at this point, so I had graduated up to dancing nude, um, that I'd like you to audition with Trisha to be her bookend type thing. And that's, that was my experience in Hollywood. I started out as a showgirl and then I ended up as a dancing nude. And Trisha, was it a done deal that you'd be a principal in the new show, Jubilee Under Development, or did you have to audition like everyone else? Um, I had to audition like everybody else, yes. Um, <laughs> at the end of Hallelujah Hollywood, um, when we knew that there was going to be a new show, um, Don pulled me aside and he said, well, you know, you'll be the old face. And I have all these beautiful principals coming to dance in the show but I'd like you to dance with Janet uh, as bookends and do the Dolly Sisters. So I thought, well, just doing the Dolly Sisters, that's not bad, I can do that. <laughs> and so, um, so Michael Pratt, I uh, worked with him uh, in between shows of, of Hollywood um, and I prepared my audition piece. And, um, and then we did a, um, prepared a Dolly Sisters piece and so we had to audition just like everybody else, yeah, yeah. But I kind of knew, because Janet was going to be in the show, I knew I'd have something to do, no, but I didn't think I would have very matter. much to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So one thing, um, you brought it up, and I was going to bring it up later, but I think it's a good thing for contextually, since we're talking about the idea about dancers, showgirls, um, and, and even though we think of Jubilee as being full of showgirls. It really technically was the first production show on the strip that did not have showgirls because if we define showgirls for the audience and define dancing nudes and, and maybe that will help because, because you talked about um, showgirls didn't do that much movement and if you could um, talk about it a little bit, Janet. Um, yeah, so I did both, obviously. But um, yeah, the showgirls, they were just they were very statuesque, very tall, had the huge costumes on. In Hallie Hollywood, we had enormous back backpacks and hats as well. Um, but they, they really were pretty much mannequins, you know, that could count and walk and stop at a right time, but, and just smile and be beautiful. 
And so we were kind of like a set dressing, I would say. But important to the show, definitely. But um, in the other shows that I, were, that I was in, um, the dancing nudes, they were tall, again, and they did wear, at some points in the show, the huge backpacks and walked. But in other parts of the show, they did some pretty serious dancing. So, um, I mean, they, they much more than the traditional showgirl did. So they were more trained and did more. So that's, that's the thing. We, we call all dancers in these shows showgirls. And, and really, Jubilee was the first show to have dancing nudes, and, and there were no showgirls. Right. Everybody danced. So um, I don't think any lay people will ever really understand that. And we'll just uh, probably be explaining that forever and ever. But, um, but that's, um, that's the story. So. Um, and Diana, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but can you talk us through what was involved in your work as a costume assistant when you came into the process? Were the designs already done? Or was this a year before the show opened? Um, yeah, I came, I came in, is it live? No, it's on orange. Okay, go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I came in um, a year, uh, before the show was to open. Actually, I came in in late April, a year before. Um, Bob and Pete had both had a lot of meetings with Don, um, and um, all of the sketches were done. Uh, Pete had been to Paris a couple of times uh, to meet with, um, uh, is it Fevrier who did the feathers? Um, and to go over the designs, he went to Paris to meet with um, a jeweler who did all of the jeweled bras and the rhinestone chain. Um, so a lot of the work had been done. When I came in, it was time to start going into production. So um, everything was pretty much approved and ready to go. So um, the first thing I did <laughs> was make this giant chart that went from one end of the uh, building all the way to the other um, with every single costume listed. Now each costume had its own number um, and um, so it wasn't just like oh group of showgirls number three. No, every costume had a number and most of the showgirl costumes, um, dancing nude costumes, um, were individual so uh, not a lot of duplication. And of course, this sounds very archaic, because you want to say, well, why didn't you just do it on the computer in a nice uh, spreadsheet? <laughs> didn't have them then. Um, so I was the organizer. Um, I would um, go over the fabric choices and make sure that the fabric had been ordered or purchased, had it arrived, had it gone upstairs to the workroom. Um, I did a lot of running around. Um, delivering a costume over to a man called Rolando, who did all of the rhinestone punching. Um, and um, oh, there was wire work for the hats that had to go be done by the metal workers. And I mean, just, just a lot of errands and research and organizing. And then, of course, once we came up uh, for fittings, um, eight weeks before, Oh, we actually came up before that to do a full set of measurements. And there's still um, dancers from the show remember um, that um, they had to put their foot on a blank piece of paper and we would trace their feet because all the shoes were being custom made for them. I don't know why that stuck out, but people still talk to me about that. Um, and then when we came up, uh, we had eight weeks and every single costume was fit individually. And I would run up and down those stairs from the basement. And you all know those stairs, 33 of them, right? <laughs> to get the next batch of uh, girls, dancers, to come downstairs, because it was their turn to fit. And uh, I made sure that all of the seamstresses and tailors were doing, you know, just all of that. Just kind of making it happen. Um, not the design part, but the, uh, the production part. Amazing. So Jubilee was originally scheduled to open on December 12, 1980. 
And uh, so for months, uh, many dancers had been rehearsing during the day and performing in Hallelujah Hollywood at night uh, before it closed in October. And then rehearsals continued, right? So, but tragically, as we know, on the morning of November 21st, a fire broke out at the MGM Grand Hotel, and, uh, which led to the death of 85 guests, including costume assistant Terry Levitt. And the fire also led to the destruction of large portions of the hotel, including all of the Jubilee sets and nearly all of the costumes, primarily from water and smoke damage. And Diana, you had been on site at the hotel working on the costume fittings, as you just described, and the morning of the fire, you were trying to sleep in your room when you heard noises outside. And can you take us through your experience that morning? Um, yeah, I, I heard a knock on my door, not a, not a you know, knock, 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 but someone rapping as they ran by. And my first thought was, darn it, I really wanted to sleep some more. But there was a weird sound in the hall, and I can't describe it, but it was just something strange. So I got out and I peeked my head out the door, and there were people running and there was smoke everywhere. So I realized this was serious, so I um, threw on some clothes and um, forgot shoes, <laughs> uh, grabbed my bag with my costume notes, and um, exited into the hallway and through the smoke made my way to the fire exit and went down uh, all those stories and stepped out onto Flamingo uh, Boulevard um, out the fire escape door and turned around and just saw this massive, massive, massive black smoke. I mean, it was... Photos really, I guess when you're there and you experience it, it seems, you know, so enormous. Um, and the noise, because uh, the helicopters were coming in from Nellis Air Force Base, fire engines were arriving, ambulances were arriving. Um, uh, the, the, the noise was incredible. And um, so I made my way across the street to um, a hotel that at the time was called Maxim's, and um, I thought I better find a, a place to kind of gather everybody. So I got a room and I went upstairs, and I still was a bit in a state of shock. Um, lay down for a minute. <laughs> then I turned on the television, and of course, there it was. And I realized that this was really serious, so I, I went back out to try and find the rest of the crew. And uh, I remember my feet were so cold, because this was November, late November, and I was on concrete in bare feet. And um, um, I had wrapped some towels around my feet, but it didn't work. And, and this guy came by, um, and he said, um, I have some sneakers in the trunk of my car if you would like them. I said, oh, yes, please. He said, they're size 13, but you can have them. So that's what I wore the rest of the day. And uh, I mean, there's more to this story, but I don't know how much, you know, uh, there's a lot, a lot that went on that day. And uh, my, my experience, though <sighs> traumatic, was not nearly as traumatic as some other people's stories. And uh, thankfully, uh, most of us survived. Two very, very nearly didn't. And uh, tragically, Terry uh, died um, uh, just outside the elevator from uh, monoxide poisoning. Yeah, and most of the most of the deaths were from smoke inhalation and and carbon monoxide poisoning. Very few people actually died from died from fire. And uh, the fire changed everything in terms of building codes and fire codes. I mean, it, it was kind of revolutionary um, in, you know, a little bit too late, but it did change a lot of things. And Diana talks about that a lot in her book. Um, so if you'd like to know more about um, her experience, um, and so the sets are in costumes are in uh, the sets and costumes are in tatters, and all of the dancers had to find alternative work while they re why they, why they were re rebuilt in preparation for the reopening in July. 
So um, I know we have some folks, I think if Lou Ann is here in the audience, um, she also, she, she left and ended up going up to Hello Holly with Hello. So you can, can you tell us what you ended up doing during this, this period between before, or did you know that you were gonna go back to the show or what did you think you were going to do? Um, I, I think Trisha and I knew that we would go back to the show um, once it came, once it started again. Um, I was lucky and I got a job as a showgirl, showgirl again, um, <laughs> at the Follies. And it was a temporary job. They knew that I would be go leaving and going back for rehearsals. But I was there for about, I think, four months. And it was so much fun because after the stress, and I was super stressed because I was the least trained principal dancer there. And so I was always, you know, measuring myself up to the other girls, especially Trisha. But um, it was uh, such a relief just to be a showgirl again <laughs> for about four months. And I didn't have to think too much. And it was just easy and fun. And that's what I did. So thank you to the Follies. <laughs> uh, so, um... Oh, after the fire, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I believe that it was after Christmas that I got a call from Don Arden, and he said, um, you know, I have to go to Paris to put on a new show there uh, called Coco Rico, and I'm taking um, Rich and Winston and... Um, Choreographer. I lost the other one, Tom Hansen, uh, of course, to do the choreography. Um, and... Uh, I'd like you to come and assist with the um, rehearsals. So um, I was flabbergasted and felt very honored that he'd actually asked me. But um, so I said, well, when would we be leaving? And he said, well, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I said, well, let me call you back. So I hung up the phone and I told my husband and then he said, well, when are you leaving? I said, well, tomorrow. So, so he's, he, he was a little taken aback, but being the good sport that he is, off I went to Paris with Don and the choreographers, and um, for me it was a wonderful experience, because I love the rehearsals. I think maybe I love the rehearsals more than I love doing the show. The rehearsals are just so fantastic to see the way that the show is conceived and then it all becomes a reality. It is, to me, just amazing. And um, I had a terrific time in Paris and um, got to rehearse all these beautiful dancers that were opening the show and then come back and be in rehearsals. We arrived back and I, maybe I was back four weeks and then we went into rehearsals. So it was an awesome time for me, yeah. And Diana, can you talk a little bit about how the costume team went about rebuilding the costumes and how the challenges posed by the loss of thousands of exotic feathers and rhinestones, um, you know, worked into that and also, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a huge job, as you can imagine. Um, and um, my notebooks had been rescued from the um, basement where all the damage was by the firemen. Um, they'd gone down there because they were told that these notebooks were like, you know, um, had the secret to, uh, I don't know, secret to success or whatever. Um, they had all of the notes on how many yards of this we need and where we got this fabric and where this was made. Um, and so they were very valuable. It was the only records really kept of um, how everything was put together. And so rather than having to um, reinvent um, the wheel, um, we were able to use my notebooks, um, which now are, by the way, uh, with the Nevada State Museum, uh, with Karen Kaufman, Fetter, I don't know if she's here, um, but she has preserved them. Uh, we went back to LA, and um, the first thing uh, was that all of the jewelry, now picture showgirl jewelry, yards and yards and yards of rhinestone chain it was all sooty. It was completely smoky. There wasn't enough time to get to make replacement rhinestones. I mean, we had literally used every rhinestone that existed. 
um, and they had come from Austria at the time. So we had to remove every rhinestone from its setting. The setting then had to be polished. The rhinestone had to be remirrored and cleaned and then reinserted in the prongs. Now, you can imagine doing it for one costume. It would take, you know, days. Well, we had thousands of costumes. So there was a whole team that did nothing but that. All of the uh, feather backpacks and headdresses, the feathers were a total loss. Um, but we were able to save the wire work that they were built on. So they had to be stripped off, which was so sad. Nothing like dead feathers. Oof. Anyway, um, all of that had to be stripped off. The wire work had to be polished and checked. And then new feathers were ordered. Now, there weren't enough feathers to replace everything. And Pete had to replace some of the feathers with different kinds of feathers. Um, I mean, the look, you know, the final result was every bit as fabulous, but um, not all of the headdresses were the same just because we couldn't obtain, there weren't enough animals with that kind of feather <laughs> living. So uh, um, there was just an incredible amount of work and a lot of time pressure because um, we started rebuilding the show in February and we knew that they were going to open in August, which meant we would be back up in Vegas fitting in July. So that wasn't much time to replace that many costumes. So a lot of long hours. So uh, the hotel went on to reopen on July 29th, 1981. It was actually a lot quicker than they expected. And so the show's premiere was on July 30th, and it was immediate success with reviewers and the public. And I'm struggling a little bit with my PowerPoint, so hopefully I can catch up um, if, uh, with some of the images in a minute. But um, Tricia and Janet, having can you tell us, having been in the previous Don Arden spectacle, Hallelujah Hollywood, how you would compare the two in terms of spectacle and glamour? And I know, Tricia, you had a moment with Don where he expressed a little nervousness before the show's premiere. And do you want to tell us about that? OK. Um, so uh, I don't know if anybody saw Hallelujah Hollywood. It's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I think it was a very beautiful show. It was glamorous and it was classical and it was beautiful. Um, and Jubilee was a step up. It was fantastic. I mean, when the opening came on stage for the first time that we saw it, I was like taken, breathtaking. It was just breathtaking with all the girls on boxes, etc. cetera. But, um, Don, some of you may know, um, tended to sometimes drink a lot. Um, and, um, and he was sitting in, in the audience at the end of a, the Hollywood show and I was walking across the stage trying to creep out to go home because I had to get up at eight to come back to work at nine. And, um, and he calls me over. So, come, come, Tricia, come. <laughs> so I went and sat down with him, and, um, and he started talking, and he goes, I don't know. I don't know if I can make it better. This is so beautiful. How can I make it better? I said, Don, don't worry about it. You'll be fantastic. <laughs> but he, he had a moment, yeah, he had, he had his moments. Um, and probably the vodka hadn't helped, but, um, <laughs> but I think he did such a wonderful job on Jubilee. It was just so beautiful. And uh, yeah, that's it. Any, any thoughts from you on having been in both shows, what, you, what your first thoughts were? It's actually really hard for me because I, I did love Jubilee, obviously, and um, but I have to say, Halle Hollywood was my favorite show. Yeah. It just was. It was just so, and I don't know, maybe it's because it was my first show, and I just was so 
impacted by it, but it was just so incredibly beautiful. Kismet, um, I mean, just the opening, um, Hollywood Blondes and the opening, it was the most glamorous show I think I've ever seen. Yeah, but I love Jubilee too. <laughs> And so I have up here on the screen um, the, one of the inside of the original program um, with some facts that I gleaned from a, a magazine from the time period. Um, hopefully they're correct. Um, in terms of performers, it was largest cast ever in Las Vegas. Um, and this was obviously at the opening. We know that eventually that um, the size of the cast shrunk. Um, and. Uh, you can see some of the, the, the major numbers there and what changed over time. So those of us who've only seen Jubilee and who saw it in the last 15 years of its incarnation, obviously we didn't see these original opening numbers and then some of the other things. We didn't see the dogfight scene um, and the, um, in the, the Vienna Tales from the Vienna Woods was removed. So anyway, that, that's, it did change over the years. Um, so. But if I can just add, after the fire, I don't think there was any lessening of the impact. It wasn't a poor man's version. It was uh, by any means. I mean, it was still every bit as fantastic. And some things were just changed or removed uh, because they really didn't work that well. I remember the dog fight was kind of, you know, planes running around on wires. I mean, I don't know. Um, so. Um, uh, you know, I think that's important. And then, of course, over the years, yes, because um, of budget cuts and things, the cast was reduced a little bit and numbers changed. But generally, I saw the show uh, after 30 years and I saw the show on its final night and it still was a knockout. And Diana, for you, what was it like to see the costumes on stage after spending so many weeks and months and seeing them come together? and be on a performer. Well, that's always a joy. I mean, that's part of the joy of my job. When you finally see it up on a human being up on stage with the lights on, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> I remember taking that piece and driving it over to get the punching done and blah, blah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really thrilling to see it all put together. And um, um, for me, there is absolutely nothing like the final walk down. All of those jewel-toned showgirls, one after another, they just keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and you, you almost can't take it anymore. And then the three white costumes come down. Yeah. Hopefully I, I get have... chills just thinking about it. Hopefully I will have those up on screen soon. This, my little clicker does not seem to be working right now. Um, but um, so let's kind of talk about your everyday life working in the show after the premiere. And um, Trisha and Janice, can you tell us about any funny incidents that, on stage or rehearsal that might stick in your mind? People always love to hear these stories. So we decided that Janet's going to talk about the funny incidents because I couldn't remember any that I had. <laughs> That's because Trisha was the ultimate professional. <laughs> she was. Okay, so I did have some funny incidents, really too many to talk about right now. But I remember after Trisha left, um, I was uh, able to do, they gave me red fan number, which was just an incredible number, right? Just everybody wants that number and the music and just everything. Well, um, I had a huge kick right before my big back bend and my shoe flew off <laughs> completely. <laughs> like didn't like kind of come off, like flew off through the air. And the boys that were with me at the time started to die laughing. I mean, the whole thing was just uh, very tough. And I finished the number with one shoe on. Fortunately, we were towards the end at that point. And then, um, oh, just, I have a million stories, but another one would be where we, we did, uh, we had a covered show, which we rarely did, but we did do one for Mother's Day. And I forgot my bra on one number. It was the disco number, and I had Pete's beautiful black back piece on, and we were staged on the elevator, and I was where I was supposed to be. I was on time. It was all good, and I'm looking around, and we're below the stage, but we're up now. We've been lifted up a few feet. 
Um, and I'm looking around and just talking, and then I realized, I went, oh my God, everyone has a bra on, except for me. So I was like, oh my God, and, and I, I couldn't get off the elevator, it was too high. So as soon as the elevator started to rise, um, we were doing these dips that we did like dips for like forever as the elevator came up and I had my back to the audience dipping though, dipping. And then as I came down the stairs, I immediately turned around and just went off the stage. But I mean, just crazy stuff like that happened to me. Never to Trisha, but can to I, me. <laughs> can I tell you one funny story about, uh, well actually it's not really about you, but it references you. Trisha had the most glorious walk. I mean, balletic, she floated across the stage. And in the red fan number, there was this red chiffon cape. And she and the cape, which, I mean, just, and then she would get to one side and she would turn. Well, um, we did a kind of gag performance for Don Arden's birthday. And we all kind of dressed up in costumes um, and uh, the cats and cr uh, the crew and did all sorts of silly gags. But the funniest one was when Winston did Trisha's walk wearing a gorilla suit <laughs> and the cape. That was so funny. And even in the gorilla suit, Winston got her walk. <laughs> I thought I would die laughing. Winston was amazing. He yes. taught us our cape number yes. with, with the pink capes that Pete did. And oh my God, he would float around and be working that cape. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was just amazing. He was so fun. And we'll have a photo of Winston coming up in a minute when I get to collaborators. But um, I just wanted to ask you, we've been kind of, the, the, it's been working a little bit. So we have some, this is you with your partners, both of you. Um, did you have a favorite costume in the show? Um, that you really loved, other than red fans, or was that a favorite number, or? Oh, that was just a favorite everything, I think, for everybody <laughs> that did it. Um, I loved Pete's black back, uh, the black backpack in disco, that was one of my favorites. I just loved the way it moved. It really bounced around, it was just so pretty. Um, and I loved, um, well, there were so many. I, I loved our dolly, our dolly dresses, the white ones the white lace, just form-fitting, the capes. I, I really liked all of them. The, I don't really have a favorite, to tell you the truth. Costumes, so. Um, and that's, that's uh, I'm with Randall right there. He was a singer in the show. Yeah, and that's just a casual shot, like in between shows we took. How about you, Trisha? Did you have a favorite? Um, well, of course, I love doing red fans and wearing the beautiful cape. I mean, who, who can't feel beautiful wearing that thing? I mean, it was just gorgeous. And, um, and like Janet, I enjoyed the Dolly Sisters costumes. They were, the, the pink cape, yes. It was, it was just such fun uh, to work with it and, um, and the beautiful white dresses. But really, every single costume was, had its own special thing. Uh, and you just felt so beautiful in it, no matter, you know, how you were feeling that day in the costume, you just felt beautiful, yeah. And this is a famous shot of, of Janet with Bob Mackey. Oh, yeah. um, and when she was, uh, uh, that wasn't the costume you wore in the show because you wore the white, um, but you were, that was a publicity shot there? That was, it was a publicity shot and it was a beautiful emerald green costume. Yeah. And they used so that on a lot of um, magazine covers and signage. Um, goodness gracious. Anyway, and so we have also that fun photo that you shared of yourself with Bob Mackey on the closing night of Jubilee, right. which is so fun. Yeah, it was, it was amazing to see him. And I have uh, just great memories of, of both he and Pete, and it was just so incredible to work with them. But yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> See if we can get this is this is the white costume, the finale costume that you both wore at, at some point, um, and then along with the original costume design uh, from Bob Mackey. Yeah, and that. you can see the the number on it in the corner, as as Diana mentioned, there all the costume drawings were numbered. Yeah, that was Trisha's original costume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I inherited it. I was so lucky. <laughs> I think I have. But I was originally the bride, so I wasn't in a white costume in the very beginning. 
the shots of you in uh, Rocky IV. Right. Um, and you, there you are with James Brown and um, Apollo Creed there um, in the white finale. So that's super fun. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about some collaborators uh, who were so important in the show. Um, obviously, Trisha's kind of told us a little bit of a story about Don. Do you have a story about Don, a Don story? Everybody has a famous Don story. So. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. yes, we have Don stories, but you know, I just remember he would come in, all of us principals would, uh, we would hide under the, <laughs> we would hide in the audience under the, booths, we would hide there because if he saw us and it was in between like just work uh, numbers, he would say, entertain me. So he would say, Janet, entertain me. Go up there and do something. Now, or Trisha or whoever, Michael. And so we would hide a little bit from him because uh, it, <laughs> it was just tough. But, um, but yeah, no, he was great. I've, I remember Sylvia Stevenson and I uh, would go over to his place sometimes and and he was just an amazing person to listen to, just his life and his stories, and it was just incredible. It was really, really very lucky, feel very lucky to have known him. These are three of his choreographers for Jubilee, um, Tom Hansen, Winston Hemsley, and Rich Rizzo. I don't know if Rich is here. Um, but this was, um, I think, taken in Paris, but um, I just thought it would be nice to see, see all of them. So you all worked with them quite extensively during rehearsals and... Yeah, they were wonderful. I know. Really amazing talent. It was just so, we feel so privileged, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see, and here's Dawn in blue. And so let's talk a little bit about the legendary Miss Bluebell and her role in selecting dancers for the show because we know that they were collaborators, but we don't always know what, um, if you could give us a little bit of, of talk about that and, and the relationship between Dawn and, and Blue and, and Trisha, owing to the fact that you were married, you're married to Patrick, who's Bluebell's eldest son. I know he's here and he wants to be anonymous, but um, was your relationship with her any different or? Um, it, you know, I started off at the Lido in Paris when I started to uh, date my husband-to-be. And um, but during all the years, we always really kept um, work and and personal life separate um, with with Miss Bluebell. Um, so it wasn't really a problem, and it didn't. I don't think that she treated me any different than anybody else that um, worked for her. Um, and yeah, yeah, maybe other people saw it differently, but I don't believe that she, she was not that kind of person. And um, if anything, she expected more um, of me than others. Uh, so, uh, and I tried to, um, keep up to her expectations, not always making it, but I did try, yeah. And Janet, uh, what was your experience working with Miss Bluebell? And what, I, I guess I need to, like she, I know she helped select girls for the show, but what was the difference between, say, her, her work in the show and then Fluff's work? Um, Trisha, why don't you do that one? <laughs> okay, so um, it, when Jubilee opened in Hallelujah Hollywood before, um, she had had a collaboration with Don since the 50s and, um, and when he um, was conceiving those shows it was, um, she was under contract to provide the girls and at, at that time um, most of the girls in the show came from Europe. Um, as time went on in, um, in Jubilee there were more and more Americans but they they did try for a long time to keep the height requirement. We did have the short bluebells and or the short MGM dancers and the um, short dancing nudes, but um, primarily they did want the taller girls because you just um, well, the carry the costumes better, particularly the larger costumes. Um, so, so that was her job. Fluff's um, Fluff's position. 
um, I think was um, more once the girls came into the show. And later on, after uh, Miss Bluebell retired, Fluff did all the auditioning in the United States primarily. She didn't really go outside of the country. Plus, it became harder and harder to bring girls in. So, um, but um, uh, she, uh, yeah, Fluff, Fluff would do the um, rehearsals, do the corrections. Fluff was like the Iron Lady, you know. <laughs> She, she had principles with egos, a lot of them in Jubilee, and, but she kept everybody in line and we did it her way. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, she was wonderful too. This is um, Michael Pratt, who is the assistant company manager. Uh, I have a picture of him adjusting your, I'm guessing it's a PR shot. Um, and we did lose Michael sadly this year, but I wanted, I did promise his sister that we would all um, like think of him and, and, and I know he would have been here if he was, if he was with us. So he was, he was Fluff's right hand man, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. so. Oh yeah, and Michael would be out there every show and he would be leaning against the wall and he had his clipboard and he would be looking at the show and then he would make a note and go, oh please don't let it be me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, let's see, well when we, uh, did you think that the show was going to go on as long as it did? Um, and I know you left in 86, 86, yeah, and then how long were you in the show, Jen? I was in the, sh I was in the show 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. I opened it and then I left in 1990. Mm -hmm. And so did you expect that Jubilee would go on for 35 years? I no, never. <laughs> Yeah. And what's interesting Amazing. is is that um, at the time the shows tended to be replaced. You know, earlier in the 1960s, the Lido was replaced every two years, and then it got to be where it was 10 years and 15 years and 20 years, and then here we are with Jubilee, which was 35 years. So, and did you ever go back and see the show after you left? I did. I went to see it um, in the early 2000s. I hadn't seen it from when I left in 86 because, well, you know, I raised a family and I got a new profession and so forth. So um, uh, I went in the 2000s and it, it had changed. It had changed and I thought, oh, oh, because I still remembered the original, uh, but it was still beautiful. And then I did see it on the last night, yeah. Yeah, I went with Trisha. <laughs> so yeah, we saw it a few times. An image of the old marquee before the, the big fancy sign that is there now, um, the old classic marquee. And um, I thought everybody would like to see this photo of Don Young. I don't know if everybody was used to seeing or had seen a photo of Don Arden as a young man. Um, that was a 1950 classic um, uh, photo taken by Maurice Seymour, who's the classic photographer of, of entertainment in those days and I just thought that was a great quote from Don it's my job to entertain you which is what he did right so um, and we can take a few questions from the audience but um, I just wanted to also tell everybody here I'm sorry for all these technical glitches um, that um, that there are a lot of us here in town that are preserving the history of, of showgirls and entertainment and one of them, my role as a curator of entertainment collections at uh, UNLV Library Special Collections and Archives. Um, we pre preserve um, lots of different types of collections of show producers and dancers. Um, as you can see, a few examples, Don Arden, Jerry Jackson, Matt Gregory, Bill Moore. Um, there's a list, there's a flyer out in the front if you'd like to see that, if you'd like to come visit us. Um, and you can also look at a lot of uh, materials online at that, um, address there and I just wanted to mention a couple other places the Nevada State Museum where Diana and Pete Menifee don't in their materials along with the Foley Brugere costume um, and also here we go um, Showgirl Legacy um, our wonderful my wonderful friend Luann Harrison um, and her work in um, the Showgirl art competition um, and then um, Grant Filippo's work with the Showgirl Museum um, so there are just a lot of initiatives in Las Vegas um, designed to uh, 
preserve the history of the showgirl in different ways, from archives to museums, and to these fabulous new podcasts done by um, Sherry Lewis and Athena Pataxel of Showgirl's Life and uh, Blue Bells Forever. So some of you may have been interviewed, some of you may, if you're interested, um, you can contact them on Facebook or, um, so they're always looking for uh, dancers and showgirls to uh, interview. Um, so if we could take a couple questions from the audience, we'd love to do that. Oh, yes, go ahead. I don't know, do I need a microphone? Um, go ahead and stand <laughs> up and, and then uh, we can repeat your question. How's that? Yeah, I, got, I got a lot of questions. Well, maybe you might give us one and then there's going to be time afterwards for everybody to talk in, in, in the lobby. So. Um, I'm going to throw two at you. Um, what did Showgirl make back then? And uh, what were some of the common, <clears throat> common injuries and accidents you guys had during rehearsals and shows? So the question is, um, what did a showgirl make back in that um, early time in the 80s? And then also, uh, what kind of common injuries would a showgirl have? Or a dancer, excuse me, dancer. I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. What, what did, what did, what did I can't that? remember the salary, honestly. You know um, what? Does anybody else know? Okay. Okay. Was it 300 a week? Okay. Yeah, I, I really can't remember, but I think that's a good answer. <laughs> I would like to tell you that the archives that we have, Don Arden's papers um, and Jerry Jackson's papers would probably tell you that information exactly from that yeah. period. So um, we, could, we could always have you go to those sources. As far as injuries go, I mean, I think I used to, I used to pull my hamstrings all the time because I just was stretching all the time and then every once in a while I would just boom and then it would pull. So I would have those kind of injuries. I'm, I'm sure some of the girls had turned ankles from trying to dance in the heels. Um, even though they were great shoes, custom made, and they were awesome, they really were. But um, I think I remember a few sprained ankles. I can't remember the other injuries if there were any. Do you? You I have to realize that with the, the stage, with turntables and things that come up, there's always a gap. So, I mean, it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, you get your heel caught in something, isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, yes. So the question is, after their career of being a showgirl, what, did they, what careers did they go into? So um, I left the show in 1986, um, and uh, I be, because I became a mother. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, and at that time I had um, because I had never finished high school, I had taken in the early 80s I had taken my GED and I had started going to UNLV. So I. Um, I had a baby and I had, was in the last classes for my accounting degree, so I decided that I really needed to, um, to leave the show in order to be able to do those other two jo jobs properly. And I had arranged with um, Bill DeAngelis, who was um, in charge of the show at that time, that um, uh, when we adopted our children and, and when... Um, I had received the letter saying that we were going to receive a child, a baby, and um, I thought, oh, well, it'll be about a year, so I called him and I said, you know, Bill, we're going to get a baby, and so I want to leave the show um, at that time. So he said, that's fine, and uh, a month later, we got the call to pick up the baby. So, <laughs> so, um, so I called him, I said, Bill, we're getting our baby tomorrow. <laughs> So I'm going to be, this is my last night, because you agreed. And so he said, yes, yes, that's fine. And so I left the show, and I continued at UNLV and got a degree in uh, business administration um, with an emphasis on accounting. And um, 
then uh, went on to uh, be hired by Deloitte and & Touche and became a CPA. So I was a CPA from um, 1992 till uh, 2018 when I retired. Yeah, so very different, very different, but good, it's good, yeah. My daughter's an accountant. Good job. Um, so I uh, left the show when I was pregnant with my first child in 1990, and I stayed home for a year, and then Richard Sturm called me, and he said, you know, we're going to start doing this thing called... It was, it was like a ca casino entertainment concept where you would have dancers and singers kind of roaming through the casino and they would spontaneously start to sing and dance and do a number. So they wanted um, a manager for that. And so, um, so they hired me to do that. And I had three boys and three girl dancers and singers. They were so talented too. They were just amazing. And uh, we did that for about a year and a half, I think. And then um, they decided that that wasn't the way they wanted to go. But the, uh, the new MGM was opening. And um, they, I went with the entertainment uh, management team over there and I helped open the hotel. And I was in the role of being like an um, entertainment supervisor type person, yeah. And I, I helped uh, do the decor for the party, casino parties and slot parties, and I would hire a lot of the models and entertainers for those type of, of events, and I did that for a while. And then I got tired of working on the holidays because my kids were small, and I had to work Christmas, I had to work New Year's Eve until very late in the day, or very late at night, because I had to be there for the strike and just everything. And it was a lot of fun and very creative, which I loved, but I just couldn't work at night anymore, and I didn't want to work the holidays. So I quit that job, and um, a few years after that, I became a realtor, and I've been a realtor for 18 years. So that's what I do. And Diana, you've stayed uh, working in costumes for quite a long time. Yes, and yes. Um, yeah, I mean, costume design was my third career, and I did it, and still kind of do it occasionally. Um, I'm, I'm actually on, I think, my fifth career now. You know, I've added <laughs> teaching and writing. So, um, you know, if one doesn't work, I'll try something else, you know. Diana's <laughs> a wonderful writer. I can attest to that. It's a, such a fun book. Um, any other questions? Yes. Is there a minimum height to be a showgirl? Yeah, the short nudes and short covered dancers were 5'8". They had to be 5'8 or higher or taller. Yeah. And then the other lines, I think, started at 5'10". Is that true, Allison? Yeah. About 5'10 for the taller lines. Principals, they really tried to keep the principals around 6' or, or taller. Pr principal girls. Since we have just a little bit more time, and then we can everybody can um, adjourn to the lobby and have lots of chat chatting going on. I know we have some um, former Jubilee cast members in here. How many of opening cast members do I have in here? If you could stand up, because so. so. Generations of Jubilee showgirls, dancers, please stand up. And because there's so much more of the Jubilee story to tell, um, we'll be having a second Jubilee panel. Um, and either later this year or early next year to talk about how the show and its performers changed over the many years that Jubilee ran on the Strip until its closing in 2016. So we'll have that to look forward to. We'll cover more of the show then. 
And uh, we'll have another event on August 5th. For those of you know, who know our friend um, Sal Angelica, he'll be doing a Las Vegas Stories on August 5th at 7 p.m. here in the, actually in the, the smaller theater. But um, if you'd like to hear about Sal's fantastic career as a dancer in Las Vegas and on Broadway with Juliet Prowse, he will be our next. There you are. And I want to thank our panelists again, uh, Janet Ford, Spellman, Janet Ford Spellman, and Tricia Lee Libuichi, and Diana Eaton. And I want to thank uh, again um, Suzanne Scott, uh, the events coordinator here at the library. And then I have some special collections colleagues that are here. Uh, Aaron Mays, who's filming the panel for us. Um, thank you so much. And my other colleagues, Sarah Jones and Clay T. White. And um, they work behind the scenes to help make our material available for all of you to look at online. And they organize it and describe it and preserve it. So the entertainment history is, is saved for everybody. So I want to thank all of them. And thank you for coming. And we, we do appreciate that you came out in such a horrible hot day. Uh, we thank you so much. And there's some water and some little snacks as you exit the room. And um, uh, we thank you so much for coming.